According to a study on the sleep habits of 400,000 Taiwanese adults, the risk of coronary heart disease is about the same in people who sleep less than four hours a night as it is in those who sleep more than eight hours a night. Subjects who underslept had a 35% higher risk of heart disease, and people who overslept had a 34% increase. Another study, published in 2009, followed 276 subjects for six years and found that people who slept either less than seven hours or more than eight hours were at least twice as likely to develop type 2 diabetes or trouble tolerating glucose. And there's more! A 2013 study of about 54,000 adults over the age of 44 found links between too much sleep and increased rates of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, stroke, and mental health issues. In fact, the rates of coronary heart disease, diabetes, and stroke were even higher in people who overslept than in those who slept too little. So the links are there. Sleep correlates with all kinds of health problems. But it's hard to say whether too much sleep actually causes these issues. It's totally possible that oversleeping is actually a symptom of things like depression or heart disease, or that there's some other connection. Either way, consistently sleeping too much might be a bad sign. Birds can be very impressive at imitation, which is another word for copying. When chicks are born, they hear sounds made by the other birds in their flock or their family, and they practice imitating those sounds until they sound just like the rest of their flock. There are lots of reasons that birds might need to know the sounds that other animals make. For one thing, birds in the wild are very social. They help out other members of their flock. The calls of different flocks of birds, even two different flocks of the same kind of bird, are all different from each other. It helps them to know who their family is by the familiar sounds they make. Some birds can even learn other animal calls that might scare away predators so the birds don't get eaten. And being good at imitating shows that a bird is smart and has a good memory and strong muscles, which makes it more appealing to other birds in its flock. The birds that can copy human speech are especially talented imitators. Birds that learn to imitate humans come from two groups. Parrots like African greys, cockatoos, and parakeets, and songbirds like minas, starlings, and even crows. They're such good imitators that sometimes they can even fool people. Some pet birds have escaped into the wild and taught the calls they learned from humans to the other birds in their new flock. So sometimes people have gone for a nature walk and heard someone calling out. They looked around for a person only to realize that the birds were the ones talking.
rising temperatures and seas, massive droughts, changing landscapes, successfully adapting to climate change is growing increasingly important. For humans, this means using our technological advancement to find solutions, like smarter cities and better water management. But for some plants and animals, adapting to these global changes involves the most ancient solution of all, evolution. Evolutionary adaptation usually occurs along timescales of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. But in cases where species are under especially strong selective conditions, like those caused by rapidly changing climates, adaptive evolution can happen more quickly. In recent decades, we've seen many plants, animals, and insects relocating themselves and undergoing changes to their body sizes and the dates they flower or breed. But many of these are plastic or non-heritable changes to an individual's physical traits. And there are limits to how much an organism can change its own physiology to meet environmental requirements. That's why scientists are seeking examples of evolutionary changes coded in species DNA that are heritable, long-lasting, and may provide a key to their future. The consumption of berries can enhance beneficial signaling in the brain. Plant foods are our primary source of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds, but some plant foods may be better than others, as I've explained before. One cup of blueberries a day can improve cognition among older adults, as shown in this randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, and the same thing in kids after just a single meal of blueberries, though two cups may work better than one. That single hit of berries may also improve mood. A double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study in which kids are asked a series of questions. Uh, are you very slightly or not at all, a little, moderately, quite a bit, or extremely interested, excited, strong, etc.? Before and after drinking the placebo, no significant change. But two hours after consuming about two cups of blueberries, their positive mood scores significantly improved. Uh, they felt more enthusiastic, alert, inspired, attentive, that kind of thing. That was in young adults, ages 18 through 21. Same thing in 7- to 10-year-old children. Some dangerous new mood-enhancing drug or Ritalin? No, blueberries, and just after a single meal. Now, blueberries can't do everything. Although a cup of berries certainly appears to improve brain function, no improvement in walking or balance was observed.
Turns out that if you can find a sport and a team you like, studies show that there are all sorts of benefits that go beyond the physical and mental benefits of exercise alone. Some of the most significant are psychological benefits, both in the short and long term. Some of those come from the communal experience of being on a team. For instance, learning to trust and depend on others, to accept help, to give help, and to work together towards a common goal. In addition, commitment to a team and doing something fun can also make it easier to establish a regular habit of exercise. School sport participation has also been shown to reduce the risk of suffering from depression for up to four years. Meanwhile, your self-esteem and confidence can get a big boost. There are a few reasons for that. One is found in training. Just by working and working at skills, especially with a good coach, you reinforce a growth mindset within yourself. That's when you say, even if I can't do something today, I can improve myself through practice and achieve it eventually. That mindset is useful in all walks of life. And then there's learning through failure. One of the most transformative long-term benefits of playing sports. The experience of coming to terms with defeat can build the resilience and self-awareness necessary to manage academic, social, and physical hurdles. How can sleep deprivation cause such immense suffering? Scientists think the answer lies with the accumulation of waste products in the brain. During our waking hours, our cells are busy using up our day's energy sources, which get broken down into various byproducts, including adenosine. As adenosine builds up, it increases the urge to sleep, also known as sleep pressure. In fact, caffeine works by blocking adenosine's receptor pathways. Other waste products also build up in the brain, and if they're not cleared away, they collectively overload the brain and are thought to lead to the many negative symptoms of sleep deprivation. So what's happening in our brain when we sleep to prevent this? Scientists found something called the glymphatic system, a cleanup mechanism that removes this buildup and is much more active when we're asleep. It works by using cerebrospinal fluid to flush away toxic byproducts that accumulate between cells. Lymphatic vessels, which serve as pathways for immune cells, have recently been discovered in the brain, and they may also play a role in clearing out the brain's daily waste products. While scientists continue exploring the restorative mechanisms behind sleep, we can be sure that slipping into slumber is a necessity if we want to maintain our health and our sanity.
steel and plastic. These two materials are essential to so much of our infrastructure and technology, and they have a complementary set of strengths and weaknesses. Steel is strong and hard, but difficult to shape intricately. While plastic can take on just about any form, it's weak and soft. So wouldn't it be nice if there were one material as strong as the strongest steel and as shapeable as plastic? Well, a lot of scientists and technologists are getting excited about a relatively recent invention called metallic glass with both of those properties and more. Metallic glasses look shiny and opaque, like metals. And also like metals, they conduct heat and electricity. But they're way stronger than most metals, which means they can withstand a lot of force without getting bent or dented making ultra-sharp scalpels and ultra-strong electronics cases, hinges, screws, the list goes on. Metallic glasses also have an incredible ability to store and release elastic energy, which makes them perfect for sports equipment like tennis rackets, golf clubs, and skis. They're resistant to corrosion and can be cast into complex shapes with mirror-like surfaces in a single molding step. Despite their strength at room temperature, if you go up a few hundred degrees Celsius, they soften significantly and can be deformed into any shape you like. Cool them back down and they regain the strength. There is a lot of water on Mars, and there once was a lot of surface flowing water. You don't, uh, you don't see it because it's, most of it is mixed with the soil, which we call regolith on Mars. So the Martian soil can be anywhere from as little as 1% in some very dry, deserty-like areas to as much as 60% water. One strategy for getting water when you're on Mars is to break up the regolith, which would take something like a jackhammer because it's very cold, it's very frozen. If you can imagine making a, a frozen brick or a chunk of ice that's mostly soil and maybe half water and half soil, that's what you would be dealing with. So you need to break this up, put it in an oven. Um, as it heats up, it turns to steam. You run it through a distillation tube and you have pure drinking water comes out the other end. There is a much easier way to get water on Mars. Um, in this country, we have developed industrial dehumidifiers, um, and, there's a, and they, they're very simple machines that simply blow the air in a room or a building across a mineral called zeolite. Zeolite is very common on Earth. It's very common on Mars. And zeolite is kind of like a sponge. It absorbs water like crazy takes the humidity right out of the air, then you squeeze it and out comes the water.
Language is an essential part of our lives that we often take for granted. With it, we can communicate our thoughts and feelings, lose ourselves in novels, send text messages, and greet friends. It's hard to imagine being unable to turn thoughts into words. But if the delicate web of language networks in your brain became disrupted by stroke, illness, or trauma, you could find yourself truly at a loss for words. This disorder, called aphasia, can impair all aspects of communication. People who have aphasia remain as intelligent as ever. They know what they want to say, but can't always get their words to come out correctly. They may unintentionally use substitutions called paraphasias, switching related words like saying dog for cat, or words that sound similar, such as house for horse. Sometimes their words may even be unrecognizable. The primary obstacle to good thinking is not a cramped desk or an uninteresting horizon. It is, first and foremost, anxiety. Often, the most profound thoughts we need to grapple with have a potentially disturbing character. As these potential implications start to come vaguely into view, our inner sensor, motivated by desire for calm rather than growth, gets alarmed. A vigilant part of the self gets agitated. It distracts us. It makes us feel tired or gives us a strong need to go online. Skillfully, it confuses and muddles our train of thought. It blocks the progress we were starting to make towards ideas that, though important and interesting, also presented marked threats to short-term inner peace. It's in this context that the shower emerges as so helpful to the way our minds work and earns the right to be honoured as one of the best places on earth in which to do any kind of serious reflection. Amidst the crashing water and the steam, and with a few minutes of respite before the day starts, the mind is no longer on guard. We're not supposed to be doing much inside our heads. We're mainly occupied with trying to soap ourselves and properly rinse our hair. The ideas that have been half forming at the back of our minds, ideas about what the true purpose of our lives might be and what we should do next, keep up their steady inward pressure. But now there's a lot less to stop them reaching full consciousness. We're not meant to be thinking. And so, at last, we can think freely and courageously.
Today, I have come to share the secrets of our success because rich capitalists like me have never been richer. So the question is, how do we do it? How do we manage to grab an ever-increasing share of the economic pie every year? Is it that rich people are smarter than we were 30 years ago? Is it that we're working harder than we once did? Are we taller, better looking? Sadly, no. It all comes down to just one thing: economics. Because here's the dirty secret. There was a time in which the economics profession worked in the public interest for everyone, but in the neoliberal era today, they work only for big corporations and billionaires, and that is creating a little bit of a problem. We could choose to enact economic policies that raise taxes on the rich, regulate powerful corporations, or raise wages for workers. We have done it before. But neoliberal economists would warn that all of these policies would be a terrible mistake, because raising taxes always kills economic growth, and any form of government regulation is inefficient, and raising wages always kills jobs. Why do we get used to everyday things? Well, as human beings, we have limited brain power, and so our brains encode the everyday things we do into habits, so we can free up space to learn new things. It's a process called habituation, and it's one of the most basic ways as humans we learn. Now, habituation isn't always bad. Remember learning to drive? I sure do. Your hands clenched at ten and two on the wheel, looking at every single object out there—the cars, the lights, the pedestrians—is a nerve-wracking experience. So much so that I couldn't even talk to anyone else in the car, and I couldn't even listen to music. But then something interesting happened. As the weeks went by, driving became easier and easier. You habituated it. It started to become fun and second nature, and then you could talk to your friends again and listen to music. So there's a good reason why our brains habituate things. If we didn't, we'd notice every little detail all the time. It would be exhausting, and we'd have no time to learn about new things. But sometimes habituation isn't good. If it stops us from noticing the problems that are around us, well, that's bad. And if it stops us from noticing and fixing those problems, well, then that's really bad.
The public realm in America has two roles. Uh, it is the dwelling place of our uh, civilization and our civic life. And it is the physical manifestation of the common good. And when you degrade the public realm, you will automatically degrade the quality of your civic life and the character of all the enactments of your public life and communal life that take place there. The, uh, the public realm comes mostly in the form of the street in America because we don't have the thousand-year-old cathedral plazas and market squares of older cultures. Um, and. Uh, your ability to define space and to create places that are worth caring about uh, all comes from a body of culture that we call the, the culture of civic design. This is a body of knowledge, method, skill, and principle that we threw in the garbage after World War II and decided we don't need that anymore. We're not going to use it. And consequently, uh, and we can see the result all around us. The public realm ha has to inform us not only where we are geographically, but it has to inform us where we are in our culture, where we've come from, what kind of people we are. And it needs to, uh, by doing that, uh, it needs to uh, afford us a glimpse to where we're going in order to allow us to dwell in a hopeful present. The comic move is to guide us to a benevolent conception of people, and hence, parts of ourselves. Comedy also does a great job at reducing power imbalances. It's hugely reassuring to see the powerful laughing at themselves. Finding oneself comical is a token of maturity. It means being able to see one's faults without being too defensive about them. Humor often provides a mechanism whereby the powerless, or at least the less powerful, can give constructive but pointed feedback to the powerful. Monty Python was particularly focused on this task. The philosopher's football match mocks the great figures of intellectual history. It's funny because we've been intimidated so deeply in the past by intellectual bullies who made us feel small with their reading of Wittgenstein or Schopenhauer. And now they're shown as being completely rubbish at football and yet seriously involved in the game. Comedy isn't just a bit of fun. The comic perspective is a central need of a society. It enables us to cope much better with our own follies and disappointments, our troubles around work and love, and our difficulties enduring ourselves. Comedy is waiting to be reframed as a central tool in a better society.
We can fertilize our food. Each one of us is pooping and peeing something that could fertilize half, or maybe all, of our food, depending on our diet. And that dark brown poo in the toilet is dark brown because of what? Dead stuff, bacteria. That's carbon. And carbon, if we're getting that into the soil, is going to bind to the other minerals and nutrients in there. Boom, healthier food. Voila, healthier people. And chemical fertilizers, by definition, don't have carbon in it. Imagine if we could move our animal manure and our human manure to our soil. We might not need to rely on fossil fuel-based fertilizers, mine minerals from far away. Imagine how much energy we could save. Now, some of us are concerned about industrial pollutants contaminating this reuse cycle. That can be addressed, but we need to separate our discomfort about talking about poo and pee, so we can calmly talk about how we want to reuse it and what things we don't want to reuse. And get this: if we change our approach to sanitation, we can start to slow down climate change. Remember that carbon in the poop? If we can get that into our soil bank. It's going to start to absorb carbon dioxide that we put into the air, and that could help slow down global warming. Our society is just more and more mobile. Everything is on the move. I mean, the good part is convenient. You can drink coffee anywhere. You don't have to stay in the diner.、You、can be in the subway. You can be walking. The bad part is it's harder to savor a coffee when you're taking it on the road. The first patent for a lid on a cup was in 1934, but it was for cold beverages. And in 1950, this guy named James Ruffsnyder invented the first snap-on lid, but it didn't have an opening for drinking. In the 60s, there was this huge cultural shift where people started drinking coffee on the move, and 7-Eleven was the first to sell coffee to go. And then came this revolution in 1967. A man named Alan Frank invented a lid that you could peel a tab off, like in the shape of a guitar pick, and drink it from there. In 1975. Another big advance: you could peel back a tab and attach it to the lid itself. So more and more people started drinking coffee on the go. In 1984, a watershed moment in the history of coffee cup lids: the birth of the traveler lid, and it is iconic. You've seen it a million times, and it solved. A whole host of problems. It's designed so that you don't splash your face because it's higher than any of the other ones. It's got this protruding rim, so it slightly cools the coffee before it hits your lips. It's got a small depression in the center for your nose, so you can really get in there and get maximum aroma. It's got this tiny air hole that lets the steam out and stops it from creating a vacuum. 
this is one of those objects where you just don't notice it until it dribbles on your lap. So I think the coffee cup lid will just continue to evolve. And you're going to see a move away from single-use plastic lids to lids that are a little more sustainable. How are we raising our children? Are we raising them for now instead of yet? Are we raising kids who are obsessed with getting A's? Are we raising kids who don't know how to dream big dreams? Their biggest goal is getting the next A or the next test score? And are they carrying this need for constant validation with them into their future lives? Maybe because employers are coming to me and saying, we have already raised a generation of young workers who can't get through the day without an award. So what can we do? How can we build that bridge to yet? Here are some things we can do. First of all, we can praise wisely, not praising intelligence or talent. That has failed. Don't do that anymore, but praising the process that kids engage in. Their effort, their strategies, their focus, their perseverance, their improvement. This process praise creates kids who are hardy and resilient. There are other ways to reward yet. We recently teamed up with game scientists from the University of Washington to create a new online math game that rewarded yet. In this game, Students were rewarded for effort, strategy, and progress. The usual math game rewards you for getting answers right, right now. But this game rewarded process. And we got more effort, more strategies, more engagement over longer periods of time, and more perseverance when they hit really, really hard problems. Just the words yet or not yet we're finding give kids greater confidence, give them a path into the future that creates greater persistence. And we can actually change students' mindsets.
I kept thinking, why does the item have to be returned to the retailer in the first place? What if there was another way, a win-win for everyone? What if, when a person is trying to return something, it could go to the next shopper who wants it and not the retailer? What if, instead of a return, they could do what I call a green turn? Consumers could use an app to take pictures of the item and verify the condition while returning it. Artificial intelligence systems could then sort these clothes by condition, mint conditioned or slightly used, and direct it to the next appropriate person. Mint conditioned clothes could automatically go to the next buyer, while slightly used clothes could be marked down and offered online again. The retailer can decide the business rules on the number of times a particular item can be resold. All that the consumer would need to do is obtain a mobile code, take it to the nearest shipping place to be packed and shipped, and off it goes from one buyer to the next, not the landfill. Now you will ask, would people really go through all this trouble? I think they would if they had incentives like loyalty points or cashback. Let's call it green cash. There would be a whole new opportunity to make money. From this new customer base looking to buy these returns, this system would make a fun thing like shopping a spiritual experience that helps save our planet. Now, typically, when we think about business, we use what I call mechanical thinking. We set goals, we analyze problems, we construct and we adhere to plans, and more than anything else, we stress efficiency and short-term performance. And don't get me wrong, this is a splendidly practical and effective way of addressing relatively simple challenges in relatively stable environments. It's the way that Bob, and probably many of us, myself included, Process most business problems we're faced with every day. In fact, it was a pretty good mental model for business. Overall, until about the mid 1980s, when the conjunction of globalization and a revolution in technology and telecommunications made business far more dynamic and unpredictable. But what about those more dynamic and unpredictable situations that we now increasingly face? I think, in addition. To the mechanical thinking, we now need to master the art of biological thinking, as embodied by our six principles. In other words, we need to think more modestly and subtly about when and how we can shape, rather than control, unpredictable and complex situations.
Unlike the moon, our dead, rocky companion, the Earth is alive, pulsing with creative and destructive forces that power its geological metabolism. Lunar rocks brought back by the Apollo astronauts all date back to about the age of the solar system. Moon rocks are forever. Earth rocks, on the other hand, face the perils of a living lithosphere. All will suffer ruination through some combination of mutilation, compression, folding, tearing, scorching, and baking. Thus, the volumes of Earth history are incomplete and disheveled. The library, the library is vast and magnificent, but decrepit. And it was this tattered complexity in the rock record that obscured its meaning until relatively recently. Nature provided no card catalog for geologists. This would have to be invented. Five thousand years after the Sumerians learned to record their thoughts on clay tablets, the Earth's volumes remained inscrutable to humans. We were geologically illiterate, unaware of the antiquity of our own planet, and ignorant of our connection to deep time. It wasn't until the turn of the 19th century that our blinders were removed. We know from history that every major industrial disruption has followed the same shape, an exponential curve, with new technologies being adopted very slowly at first, but then a doubling rate kicking in consistently until the overall transformation happens very quickly in the end. It's a movie we've seen many times before, whether from horses to cars, from valves to transistors, or landlines to mobile phones. And we understand how it works. Uh, initially, the cost of technology is high, but as we learn through volume adoption, the cost goes down and adoption goes up. Best example right now would be electric batteries, consistently coming down in cost by 20% a year for the last 10 years. Um, and as the volume of adoption grows, especially with um, electric vehicle sales growing, we can be confident that the costs of that technology will continue to go down, driving that exponential growth. We set these exponential Goals because we believe in the power of human innovation.、Uh, engineers love these goals, these stretch targets. It's what they live for.
First, let's talk about how smell works. From coffee to stinky trash, the substances around us give off volatiles, which you can think of as tiny smell molecules. We breathe in these smell molecules, which then stimulate the olfactory sensory neurons that sit high in the nose. Each of these neurons contains an odor receptor on its surface. Once the odor receptors are triggered by these smell molecules, the neurons send information about them to the brain. Here's what I think is so cool. The brain not only categorizes that information as a particular odor, it may also begin to associate feelings like pleasure or disgust and other moods and emotions with that odor for future reference. For example, you sniff bacon. You eat it, your taste buds get salt, and then your body gets a whack of fat, which is an energy source. So the brain loves it and attaches a positive label to it. The next time you smell bacon, a sensation associated with pleasure arises. This phenomenon of conservation is explained by what we call the first law of thermodynamics, sometimes referred to as the law of energy conservation. The law states energy cannot be created or destroyed. Energy can be described as the ability to do work, where work is the movement of matter when a force is applied to it. A closed system is a system which no matter or energy is allowed to enter or leave. The first law of thermodynamics tells us that the amount of energy within an ecosystem is constant. It doesn't change. An open system, on the other hand, allows stuff to come in and go out. Since most systems are not closed, the laws of energy conservation can be rephrased to say that the change in the internal energy of the system is equal to the difference between the amount of energy coming in minus the amount of energy going out. In other words, the amount of energy in the system can change, but only if it comes from another system or goes to another system. At any rate, systems, whether they're open or closed, do not create or destroy energy. Rather, energy can enter from one system and leave to another.
Cartoonists are like sponges. They soak up people, places, mannerisms, clothing, and behavior. Sometimes they might jot them down in a little black book that they carry around with them. Other times it is just soaked up into the cartoonist's brain, only to be squeezed out later when she is sitting at her drawing table. Not only does a cartoonist have to be aware of what she is seeing visually, but she has to listen to herself think. In other words, take the incoming information and select it, shape it, and then use it for a cartoon. Now that you have an idea or something you think might be good for a cartoon, it's time to shape it. A cartoon is like a staged play. The cartoonist is playwright, director, stage designer, choreographer, and costume designer. The cartoon has characters, a set, dialogue, even if one line, and a backstory. The characters must be dressed to fit the idea, speak in a way that is natural and forwards the idea or gives the punchline. Nothing should be in the cartoon that is not absolutely necessary for the advancement of the idea. The image and words have to dance together in a way that makes sense. It can be a graceful dance or an awkward dance if that is part of the humor or idea. And then the execution. Some cartoonists sketch the idea with pencil, then ink it with pen using a light box. Others visualize the image in their head and draw directly on the paper in pen. And as Great Britain grew, interest in tea spread around the world. By 1700, tea in Europe sold for 10 times the price of coffee, and the plant was still only grown in China. The tea trade was so lucrative that the world's fastest sailboat, the clipper ship, was born out of intense competition between Western trading companies. All were racing to bring their tea back to Europe first to maximize their profits. At first, Britain paid for all this Chinese tea with silver. When that proved too expensive, they suggested trading tea for another substance, opium. This triggered a public health problem within China, as people became addicted to the drug. Then in 1839, a Chinese official ordered his men to destroy massive British shipments of opium as a statement against Britain's influence over China. This act triggered the first opium war between the two nations. Fighting raged up and down the Chinese coast until 1842, when the defeated Qing dynasty ceded the port of Hong Kong to the British and resumed trading on unfavorable terms. The war weakened China's global standing for over a century. <laughs> 